Thank you very much, everyone, tonight for joining us tonight and with the Dearborn Library Program with Mr. David Vandrelli, author of the Book of Charlie, uh, Wisdom from the Remarkable American Life of a Hundred Year Nine Year Old Man. Uh, just a few things uh, to go before we start. Uh, I just want to encourage everyone to, uh, listening to. Uh, Join, join in on our summer reading program. We have great prizes. We, uh, we have gift cards. We have an arrow garden. Uh, please join us. All the information is on our library website. Uh, and just want to alert you next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. We'll be talking with Mr. Jonathan Egg. Uh, new Martin Luther King biography is an excellent book. Uh, so please, you can register for the event on our events calendar. You can either uh, join us here at the library or view, view it on Zoom. So at 6.30 on uh, to this coming Tuesday, the 11th. So we're pleased to welcome Mr. V David Vandrelli. He's a deputy opinion editor and columnist focusing on national affairs and politics for the Washington Post. Uh, he's... Uh, the author of a number of books, including the award-winning bestseller, Triangle, The Fire That Changed America. And he lives in uh, Kansas City with his wife, journalist uh, Karen Ball, and their children. So thank you very much for joining us tonight, David. I appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. So you had a really, it's a Really great idea how you came up with the idea for this book. Can you go in further into detail about it? Well, sure. Uh, the, the genesis of this book was that my wife and I uh, decided in 2007 to uh, move from the uh, East Coast, Washington, D.C., where we had lived for a number of years and started our family. Um, back to the middle of the country uh, where we're both from. We settled in uh, a suburb of Kansas City um, and uh, we just were in the process of unpacking. We had a house full of half empty moving boxes. It was a hot August morning when I went outside to get my newspaper and looked up and saw my new neighbor across the street. He was in the driveway uh, wearing just a pair of swim trunks. Uh, his muscular chest was flexing as he washed his girlfriend's car with a garden hose and a sponge. He waved to me with his uh, sponge hand. I waved back. And what was so notable about the scene was that Charlie had just a few days earlier turned 102 years old. Um, I saw this scene of this vital character more than a century old, uh, you know, doing a favor for his girlfriend on a Sunday morning. I said, that's somebody I need to get to know. Um, uh, you don't expect when you meet somebody 102 years old that you're going to be starting a long friendship, but in this case it was. Uh, Charlie and I were friends for the next seven years until he passed away at age 109. Uh, and he was sharp and interesting and uh, joyful and wise to the very end. Uh, it was only after he died, though, that I realized that he had lessons to teach uh, our generation and more importantly, uh, my kids about how to live through decades of phenomenal conflict and change and uh, upheaval and disruption, and yet do it with uh, equanimity and uh, usefulness and kindness and joy. And those were the lessons that my kids are going to need because the century ahead is going to be full of change and disruption. Uh, and I realized that Charlie uh, was a person who could 
could show them how to do this. This was a guy who was born before radio was invented and lived long enough to use a smartphone. He was uh, born before there really were many cars and certainly no meaningful paved highways when most people got around by walking or by horse and buggy. And he lived to see people on the International Space Station. Uh, he was born before human beings had ever set foot on the North or the South Pole or the top of Mount Everest. And he lived to see footprints on the moon and tire tracks on the face of Mars. That's a lot of change, a lot of disruption um, and a lot of upheaval. And yet he showed that change can be navigated uh, can, and, and can be made into our friend and we can do it uh, without fear, without anxiety, uh, but with confidence and optimism. Yeah, the, uh, now the kid, you tell a nice story in the beginning of the book where you want to create a, write something that would be impactful for your children, uh, where you yes. literally read to them by the nightlight almost yes. in the in the hallway uh and uh, uh it's it's very it's very very nice how you were able to come up with this idea for this idea presented itself uh thank you yeah uh now what is a big way of looking at life is stoicism what right. is it what is it? How, how did Charlie put it in a put it in a practice? I guess Stoicism uh, is an ancient classical philosophy of the Greeks and Romans. Uh, it has a kind of a bad rap. I've found people think it means having no feelings, uh, being uh, cold, dour. Um, you know, immune to uh, to love and passion. That's not it at all. Um, what Stoicism teaches is just the simple reality that in our lives, there are things that we can control. Uh, and those are the things that are produced by our own will and effort. Uh, and then there's a lot that we cannot control. We can't control other people. We can't control uh, fate. We can't control the weather, uh, you know, whether there's war or peace, or whether the government is well run or badly run. Uh, so many of these things are outside of our personal control. And that the key to happiness is to focus all of our attention and energy on the things that we can determine and to let go of all the anxiety about things that we cannot, uh, we, we can't change them even if we want to. That means learning to let go of the past, uh, except for what we can learn from it. Uh, it means uh, being peaceful about the future except for the ways in which we might be able to shape it by uh, our wise actions and our good decisions. And live in the moment and emphasize that which wi is within our power. Uh, Charlie learned this philosophy, I think, very young when he lost his father in a freak accident when he was eight years old. And his whole world was changed. His mother, who had no work uh, to support uh, her, was left alone with five children. Uh, she had to find her way. All the kids had to pitch in to keep the family together. Um, and all they had was their wits and their energies and their hard work, their determination, their self-discipline, the things they controlled. 
uh, they had not been able to control whether dad came home from work that day, which he never did. Um, Charlie then was able to apply that lesson again and again throughout his life. And, and the result was a kind of freedom and happiness, joy, passion, uh, because he was in control of his life. He took responsibility for the things he could influence and he learned to let the other things go. Were there times when you sand start, he admitted that worries, his worries bothered him? Oh, sure, of course. Um, he had a lot of, you know, there were a lot of hard things in his life, uh, and not just his father's death, but his first marriage was very difficult um, and ended in tragedy. Uh, he had a very brief second marriage that didn't work out because he was so emotionally wounded from the first marriage. Um, he even outlived his third wife uh, with whom he was able to have a family, um, but uh, she died long before Charlie did. Um, he had his entire career uh, as a general practice doctor uh, disrupted, first by the Great Depression, and then uh, by uh, the total transformation of medical practice uh, with the uh, development of penicillin and advanced surgical techniques. Suddenly doctors who really only had their own bedside manner to contribute to their patients uh, were able to uh, prescribe curative medicines and surgical techniques and practice of medicine was changed overnight. Suddenly, doctors needed to be specialists and, uh, and have a specialty. Charlie adapted to that by becoming one of the first anesthesiologists in the, uh, the Midwest. Uh, so he, he hit plenty of bumps uh, in his life. Um, I don't mean to suggest that he was cavalier about that, but when he hit a bump, uh, his reaction was to ask himself, well, what can I do about this? And if there was nothing to be done, then he tried to, you know, let go of it and move on. But if there was something that he could do, uh, then he would focus on that and try to bring that to bear. He also made tons of mistakes and, and uh, he, he loved his mistakes as much as his uh, as his successes, um, because he knew that you know we all make mistakes. The question is, what do we learn from them, and uh, how do we grow from them? So it's a very positive kind of way of living, and that it uh, and very liberating because it sets you free from the anxiety uh, and depression, you know. I sometimes ask myself, you know, what's depression except regret for things that have happened? And what's anxiety other than fear about the future? But we can't change the past and we don't control the future. So those are wasted emotions. Um, that's, the, that's the liberating insight of stoicism. Oh yeah, you're not you're not being cavalier. Just uh, 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 we all make mistakes. We all have uh, regrets. It's just interesting to see, find out his process, find out yes. what what his approach was. Uh, yes. So, so uh, you obviously obviously sounded like you uh, talked with Charlie. For a not, for a long time, uh, how long did was it? Like afternoons or every afternoon or free? You just sat sat and talked. Yeah, um, I was working mostly from home, and uh, I mean, I I have always said I've been socially distanced for years. You know, even before the pandemic, because I was working remotely at that time for 
Time Magazine. Um, and uh, I would, uh, you know, notice uh, that Charlie was home across the street, or I might realize that I had a, a half hour or an hour to spare. And I'd just go over and knock on his door. Um, one of the things that amazed me and impressed me about Charlie was that uh, he, he lived to this phenomenally uh, great age, um, but he always had friends, even though he had outlived not one, but two generations of friends, he was still making new friends uh, to the end. He befriended me, he befriended other uh, young people, young doctors, people in uh, different clubs that he belonged to uh, who were, you know, 40 and 50 years younger than he was. Uh, it's essential to happiness, I think, in old age to continue to connect with new people and uh, continue to stretch and grow. And yeah, so I'd go over and sit with him and uh, we'd talk. So he, he was interested in me. Uh, I was obviously interested in him. And he would tell me the stories from his, you know, life of adventure and uh, experiment and innovation. And I never thought at the time that I was writing a book. I thought I was just making a friend. Um, but, you know, I think I was able to do the book the way I did it because it flowed from a genuine friendship and it, it wasn't just a writing project. Well, the, yeah, uh, from what I've read that you, and like you just said, you wrote it, started writing about it after he passed. Uh, yes. So what was the, uh, so, and you were, you spoke with family members or, or just to get, get like the gist of things or like we, the tone of what, uh, what he thought about things. Yeah. It was a mixture of things. We interviewed his family. Uh, we did some, uh, I had a lot of help from my wife, who's a tremendous uh, reporter, journalist, in uh, tracking down various uh, archive uh, material um, related to the story. I did a lot of, uh, of study in just basic American history because, you know, we tell all sorts of uh historical tales in the book that relate to uh, Charlie's life um, because he was there at the beginning of so much. He was living the 20th century history of America. He, you know, he was around for World War I uh, and a worldwide pandemic in 1918, the flu pandemic. He was one of the first people uh, in America to drive from uh, Kansas City to Los Angeles uh, in a Model T Ford. This was before there were really any paved roads across the Western United States. Uh, he, you know, lived through the Great Depression. He was around for the, you know, uh, crazy days of prohibition and the gangster wars of Chicago in, in the time of Al Capone. He was there. He was there when jazz first became a craze uh, carried by the earliest radios in America. He lived through the Great Depression. He served in World War II. Uh, he performed one of the first open heart surgeries uh, in the United States. Um, you know, and on and on and on. Traveled to Peru to operate on the president of Peru at the personal request of uh, President Harry Truman and his uh, White House physician. So uh, Charlie had these stories and I would listen to them and obviously just be amazed. It was very helpful to me. I will say this for people who are trying to save the stories of their own uh, elderly loved ones. Charlie's family invested in having uh, a professional oral history company uh, interview him for three hours and get these stories down 
uh, in recorded form. And that was hugely helpful to me uh, as I worked on my book. Uh, I had heard all the stories that he told in that oral history, but it was very useful to be able to listen to them again and check details and uh, that sort of thing. So having that record, uh, families, I encourage you to, to act and, and try to get that done in your own lives uh, before it's too late. Uh, we all have stories that should be preserved. Well, one of his favorite stories is, is like you mentioned, our, he and his uh, friends after graduating high school drove from uh, Kansas to uh, Los Angeles. And uh, uh, with the Henry Ford Museum being a short drive away from here, I uh, uh, checked with them and they uh, it was interesting to see the guides that they had, uh, but uh, he really, I guess, from what I took from, from it was the, he felt, and I think there's a phrase in a book, on his own, uh, yeah. like independent. Uh, was that the f feeling you got? Absolutely. Uh, Charlie was very self-reliant uh, and he credited his mother, uh, interestingly, with that. You know, I live, uh, my generation is really, the generation of helicopter parents. Uh, if we make mistakes parenting, and we certainly do, uh, it's from being overly involved uh, in our children's lives. Uh, Charlie's mother was the opposite. Um, she r raised her kids with a very light hand. Um, and in fact, when he took that trip at age 16, uh, with a couple of friends to California and then wound up getting back home by jumping on freight trains and passenger trains, making his way uh, back uh, to Kansas City. Uh, his mother didn't even realize he was doing it. She thought he was just off uh, in the Kansas farm country, uh, earning some money for college uh, by helping with the harvest. So. Uh, he, he, the way he put it was, mom put the responsibility of life on us at an early age, and he was grateful for that. Uh, I suppose not every child would respond well to that, but for Charlie, it was liberating. It, uh, he liked growing up fast. He liked people counting on him, uh, and he liked the feeling that he could take care of himself in uh, any situation. So, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, you just ha had uh, 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 all these stories in his life, where uh, and uh, it was quite remarkable how you talk about Kansas City in the 1920s, how it was like the Paris of the Middle West. You uh, and it was also quite remarkable about how these creative, innovative people uh, lived there at the time, like Walt Disney uh, got his start there. Uh, is it like they're not? Is, like, is Kansas City like they're not? You know, um, Kansas City's in, uh, really in another exciting uh, growth phase, a dynamic phase, a, a, I feel like we're getting uh, more young people coming here. Some of that's been the uh, pandemic when uh, people stopped going into their offices in big cities in Chicago and New York, San Francisco, and began to realize that they could uh, uh, work in places that maybe were a little less expensive or a little less uh, high stress. Um, a little more uh, friendly. We think of ourselves, you know, Kansas City nice uh, is an expression that we we use. But a hundred years ago, uh, Kansas City was the thrilling, uh, you know, they called it the wide open town. It was run by a uh, political machine called the Pendergast Organization. Uh, 
They paid no attention to prohibition. Uh, and Kansas City was the big city where kids from the farm country all around the Midwest would go to uh, experience, you know, uh, this excitement and to try to live and try to uh, make their start. Some of them uh, were just passing through people like Walt Disney, uh, who was drawing his first cartoons uh, at the time that Charlie was setting off on that uh, drive to Los Angeles. Um, uh, Ernest Hemingway came through Kansas City for a while at about the same time. Uh, the great general John uh, Blackjack Pershing uh, was from this area. Others stayed. Um, a kid from uh, rural Nebraska uh, decided to make his way in Kansas City. He, he had a couple of boxes of postcards and he thought he could sell them and make a little profit. And he built that postcard business into a company called Hallmark, uh, if you care to send the very best. Um, another farm girl from Kansas, Nell Donnelly, uh, came to Kansas City and built the largest company in the world, Nellie Don, um, and so on. Uh, this was a place where people were discovering themselves and, and uh, you know, they were, it's where that the last gasp of the agrarian past kind of uh, ended and the, and the 20th century with all its economic and cultural dynamism took off. Well, this, uh, you may get this question about this book a lot, but what do you, what do you think was the secret to Charlie's life? Yeah, of course, everybody asked him in his old age, what's the secret to a long life? And uh, Charlie was a doctor. He understood science, understood human uh, body. His answer was always the same. Uh, there's no secret. It's just luck. Uh, it's your genome. It's uh, do you get a, a life-threatening illness? Do you have a terrible accident? like his father had. Um, none of those things happened to Charlie, uh, not because of any particular thing he did, but as he put it, he just got lucky. Um, he, all of his, his organs kept going to the end, his brain, his heart, lungs, everything uh, worked for over a century and that's rare. Uh, what I do think he had a secret of is not so much a long life, uh, but we also measure our lives in terms of their depth. Uh, and Charlie had a, a deep and meaningful life uh, in, in, in large part because he understood what was important, uh, what mattered, what he could affect. He didn't stress out about things that he couldn't influence. Uh, but he also had a deep feeling of commitment to other people. Um, and um, this is... Uh, Oops. Yeah, I may have yanked his phone out or... Uh, Well, sure has been interesting. <laughs> Hopefully. No, I didn't want to keep them for too much longer. I uh, didn't want to keep them for too much longer if, if when he's in the car like that. He must be sitting in his backyard or something or whatever. Maybe the wife and the dogs or whatever are in the house and they didn't want the noise or something in the background. <laughs> Uh, phone call. <laughs> right. That looked like they were driving. Oops. Uh, let's go back here. No fun.
Yeah. It... Okay, I'll get you back on here. Yeah. Back to the co-host, that's what was last time. And then I would talk, and then I guess come up with the co-host. Yeah, I was uh, maybe five, ten minutes more. Okay. 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 Now let's see if we can promote to co-host here. Hmm. He's a pen the last way, is it? Okay. Now let's promote him to a co-host. Okay. Now he should be able to unmute himself and, and make himself. Once he gets his camera going again. So, okay. All right. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple more questions in the short Q&A. Uh, all right. Uh, so, yeah, the secret of his life. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, is, I apologize for cutting off there. What I wanted to say was uh, the human connection and being useful uh, to other people and being part of community was really important, I think, to Charlie's uh, uh, character and his, uh, his, his vitality. Uh, he used to say that the reason he wanted to be a doctor and got so much out of being a doctor was that there was no other profession or line of work that could bring a person into such intimate contact with people in their times of need. Uh, it really mattered to Charlie to be a part of other people's lives, to be useful to them, to be able to care for them. And uh, that connection, uh, I think, was one of uh, his secrets of life. And then he said his philosophy boiled down to his mother's teaching. Uh, which was simple, do the right thing. Uh, as he said, if you do the right thing, that covers all manner of uh, situations. Uh, just about every uh, question that can be put in front of you, uh, ask yourself, what's the, the next good thing that I can do, right thing that I can do, and this, go ahead and do it. All right, uh, yeah, let's just do one more question. And since you're writing a book, or the idea of writing a book to help your children ma maneuver through all the changes in, in life, in short life, what do they think of the book? <laughs> They've been very, very nice. One of my daughters helped us with the design of the cover of the book, which I really love. I think it's a beautiful looking uh, a book. It kind of captures the mood and, and spirit. Um, one of my daughters, this, this was very meaningful to me. She said that uh, all the forced reading that she had to do in high school had really spoiled books for her after all the fun we had had reading together. Uh, at bedtime for many years when they were little. Uh, she said reading the book of Charlie had reignited her passion for books and that she was uh, uh, back to the bookstore, back to the public library and, and back to reading. So I can't think of anything much more rewarding than that. Yeah, as a librarian, I'm like, that's cool. That, that, <laughs> I appreciate that. So, all right. So we'll go to uh, uh, questions uh, online. You go, go to the Q&A. You can ask and uh, got some people here in the audience if they have any questions.
Uh, question from the audience. How long have you been with uh, Post? Yes, well, I want to first say to the audience, both online and there in the library, I am really sorry there have been some technical difficulties, and I'm incredibly grateful to you for sticking with us um, and uh, for your interest in this story. Um, you're very kind uh, to be so patient with me. Um, I've been with the Post now for um, a total of about 20 years, but in two bites. Uh, I went to work at the Post uh, as a 30-year-old back in uh, 1991 and uh, worked for 15 years uh, in a variety of jobs, both as a reporter and as an editor. Um, then I went to Time Magazine for 10 years as editor at large um, and uh, had a, a great experience at time, but then I returned to the post in 2017, uh, now I guess almost six years ago, uh, to write a column uh, twice a week on uh, national affairs, uh, politics, whatever struck my fancy. And then for the past six months or so, I've been pulled back into editing and I've been helping to lead the opinion section at the post. Okay, so I got a question here online. Uh, let's see. Uh, question online, when it comes to dwelling on the future or the past, is it important to take a breather and relax uh, and afterwards staying in the present? So I guess, uh, is it good to, uh, as much as possible to maybe stay in the present? And that, that's that's yeah. what Charlie tried to do, right? Yeah, Charlie understood that the present moment is, that's where we live, whether we like it or not. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean we don't have interest in the past and future. I mean, he, here I am, I write books about history. You know, I, I spend a lot of my time uh, arguably in the past, but I'm not trapped there. I'm not, um, I'm not trying to change the past. I'm not regretting uh, the past, so whether we like it or not, the only moment we can touch, R Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great American philosopher, teaches this. Uh, he says, you know, we waste our lives peering into the past or straining to see the, the future. All we can touch is the present moment, and it contains everything we need. Um, it, the, the moments that we have are, are no less powerful, no less promising than uh, the, 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 the moment when uh, you know, Mozart sat down uh, to write it, start writing his Requiem or Shakespeare sat down to start writing Hamlet. Uh, every present moment holds the whole universe in it potentially, and it's, it's up to us what we decide to make of it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you join, joining us. I mean, uh, sorry about the mix up on this end, and, but I really appreciate it yeah, because I enjoyed the book very much and I wanna encourage everyone uh, to, to out there to pick up a copy. Uh, oh, got one more question. Sure. Um, how was your life influenced by Charlie? How was your life influenced yeah. by Charlie? I, I, you know, all of these lessons that we've talked about and that I write about in the book of Charlie um, are, are lessons that I've known, you know, sort of all my life. Uh, at the end of the book, I talk about Charlie taking out a piece of paper in his 108th year and writing down just the, the things he'd learned that were most important in life. And they were little two and three word things like, you know, learn to forgive and ask for forgiveness, uh, you know, spread joy, uh, take, take pleasure in uh, the present moment and uh, enjoy beauty, 
uh, experience wonder, observe miracles, and make miracles happen. Uh, love people, take risks. Um, all of these things, I, I knew they were true, but it seems so hard sometimes to uh, to do them and to keep this kind of attitude uh, front and center. Watching Charlie and spending time with him uh, helped me to get better at at doing these things, at at uh, at not ignoring them just because they're simple. You know, these little truths. They're familiar not because they're trite. They're familiar because they're true. And they've been proven true by human lives all across the world and all across time. You see these lessons cropping up in every religion, in every philosophy, in every culture, in every era. And it's because they, they really do contain you know, the operating code of a happy and useful life. And there is a, you had to follow up. The other question is, has this book been uh, reviewed and any award has been given to it? Uh, short of it, how has the book yeah. been received? <laughs> uh, the, the reception has been very strong. I heard he was uh, a question about re reviews. The, uh, you, there was a, a really generous review in the Wall Street Journal um, in late May. Uh, there have been uh, other reviews in, you know, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, Shelf Awareness. Uh, uh, it's it's gotten, uh, I, I don't like to, to brag on myself. I'll, I will say that this book has landed with readers in a way and with a kind of power uh, greater than uh, any other book I've written before, it does seem to strike a chord with a lot of, of people. No awards yet, but um, we, we'll see as as uh, as it gets out in the world and and the year goes on. Okay, well, thank you again, David. Uh, I appreciate your time, and yeah, it's it's struck a chord with me. The books struck a chord with me. It remind, reminded me of what's important in life. So thank That's you great. very much. And thank uh, you. Thank you for joining us and have a good night. Same to you. Bye-bye.